Hello, everyone. Hi. Hi there. <laughs> Hi guys, thank you so much for being here. Welcome to another incredible stream on Adobe Live. Um, if you're new around here, Wednesdays on Adobe Live are all about diving into everything Photoshop has to offer. And I'm really, really excited for our special guest today, Daniel Livingstone. Hi, Daniel, how are you? <laughs> Hi there, I'm good, how about yourself? I am doing awesome. I'm already looking over here at the chat. We've got so many people in here. Hi, Apurva, hi, Cody, Joshua, Penny, Keys. Uh, so many people. Umicorn. Hi, guys. Thank you guys for being here. And I have both our YouTube chat and our Behance chat. So please, please say hello. Tell us where you're watching from. It's always awesome to see where everyone is in the world. <laughs> so um, before I forget to share, be sure to join our Adobe Live community and subscribe to the Adobe Live channel on YouTube. Um, hopefully someone will put down the link somewhere. That would be great. <laughs> um, but yeah, let's just get started. We have so much to learn from you, I feel like. So yeah, we're here here with Daniel Livingstone. Um, I know you're a lifestyle photographer. I take a look, I took a look at your work and have been like googly eyed over just all this texture and like the action. And yeah, if you can tell us a little bit, um, a little bit about you and, and you know, who you are and for anybody who is new to you. Of course. Um, so my name is Daniel. I'm a commercial fitness photographer based here in Chicago, Illinois. Um, I personally got invested in the fitness lifestyle back about three years ago, and I used it as a tool to really supplement my physical and mental health. And that was just such a life changing experience for me. So when deciding what genre of photography I wanted to pivot my business into after uh, the pandemic, I decided that I might as well shoot what I live and that was fitness. So I've been doing that for about three years now. And uh, the, me the core messaging of the work that I create is really meant to inspire people to make fitness and health a bigger priority in their lives. So I just really hope that in all the things I shoot, whether it's weightlifting, stretching, yoga, running, um, it really motivates people to take uh, a more active approach in their health. I love that. I think that's like, you know, that's like a, such a good uh, be about it, you know, type of attitude. Um, and it's awesome that you've made it like your career and, and your passion, you know, your passion has turned into your career. So that's awesome. Uh, we've got some people already mentioning where they're watching from. We've got someone from the Netherlands, uh, from India, SF Bay Area. Same here, Joshua. <laughs> uh, we've got Raphael from Paris. That's incredible. Thank you guys so much for joining us. Um, we've got a special stream for you guys today. Day, and it's all about streamlining your photo editing workflow. We'll get to see a little bit of Lightroom Classic and definitely a lot of Photoshop. I'm personally super excited to see. I always love seeing other creatives um, share their workflow. So I feel like we should just get started. Oh, we have someone from Guyana. That's incredible. Uh, super, super cool. Uh, Penny says, hooray, love fitness. Uh, yeah, so do I. I feel like I've been on my health, you know, fitness journey. So I'm very excited to keep that <laughs> going. So yeah. Can you share a little bit more about what you're going to be working on today and just get started? Of course. So, uh, Although my work is about fitness, fitness is pretty all-encompassing. So we're actually not going to do any workout, no weightlifting, no sports. Today is going to be all about recovery. So uh, nice. I did a photo shoot uh, recently where I wanted to focus on more recovery uh, scenes, but includes foam rolling, massaging, uh, oh, some of the nutritional that. aspect as well. We did some, some shots in the kitchen. So it's going to be very, very lifestyle, almost like a stock photo e look, but yeah. definitely still like my style. So we're going to take some really clear clean lifestyle shots and try to elevate them through our retouching. And what yeah. today's stream is going to be all about is using some of the automated tools and the integrations between Lightroom and Photoshop to maximize your workflow. So um, I don't know about you, Arabella, but for me, I always run into the issue where I really want to get the look out and maybe I'll edit something and I'll go, oh my God, this is amazing. But it took me like two hours to edit a single photo in yes. Photoshop. And I still have about 20 other photos to edit from that same shoot. You are totally not alone though. I feel like it's always like that for the first image. And once you've got your groove, once you figure out like what it is that you like, then it's a lot much, much easier to go with the rest of it. But honestly, it does take a really long time for that first shot. <laughs> so I've been uh, retouching in Photoshop for almost a decade now. And uh, through that time, I've really learned how to maximize my workflow. So still being able to get those high quality, high level retouched images through Photoshop, but still being able to do a batch of images from the same shoot oh, to get yes. that output going. Definitely, I love that. I feel like we can all use streamlining techniques and tips to to make 
so we can get back to like the fun and creativity of just shooting and, and all of that and then see the final product a lot quicker <laughs> yeah so um i'm gonna start off here in lightroom this is usually my workflow as it stands so you're going to be seeing a very real process of how i would go about editing a shoot um so i take all my images into lightroom i make my selects i use the star rating system so i have my top five images right here for you guys hopefully we'll get through all of them that's the goal um yes. So starting with this first shot here, I have a foam rolling scene. It's a horizontal shot where the model is rolling out that hip. We have some weights placed in the scene and I really wanted to capture a very realistic home workout yeah. scene and everything really lends it to that realism. So the makeup was really minimal. We did like a blow pony, um, didn't go too crazy with like the glam of the outfit and everything. So we wanted to keep it very authentic. Um, and we shot it in an actual home. This is not a set. This is not like some big Hollywood production. This <laughs> right. is just me, a model and a makeup artist getting together and hanging out in an apartment, just shooting pictures for fun. I love that. Uh, Cody, thank you so much for dropping in Daniel's uh, website. It's daniellivingstonephoto.com. Uh, make sure to check him out. Actually, follow him on Instagram as well. Um, We've got a few more people in here, but uh, yeah, I actually really love that you chose to focus on recovery. I feel like recovery is just as important as the actual workout itself. Um, I've had to learn that the hard way. <laughs> so. No, and me too, honestly. It's kind of a more recent thing in my life. Uh, I had a an injury or two uh, towards the end of last year, and then mm -hmm. I spent a lot of the first quarter of this year learning about recovery. So whatever I'm shooting, it's usually pretty present in my life. So I went through a little bit of physical therapy. I learned a lot about how not just muscles, but also tendons and joints and bones work. And that was so fascinating to me. Yeah. So I started to immerse myself in the world of recovery and learning like, oh, how does nutrition affect this? How does stretching affect this? Totally. What does a good totally. warm up look like? So that's what I'm trying to capture here in these scenes. I love and, it. Uh, I feel like you're already there and it's, I mean, it's already a, a great image, so I can't wait to see the final product, but yeah. you guys, he is a well of, wealth of knowledge. Uh, please ask any questions in the chat. I'm sure Daniel would love to answer them. Um, I'll, I'll make sure to uh, interrupt you when <laughs> people do, but always happy yeah. to help. <laughs> yeah, definitely. So before the stream, I actually did a little bit of playing around with these files just to make sure I knew where we wanted to go with them just to save all of us some time. So I have a little test edit here, but I can break this down awesome. uh, from scratch for you guys. So I'm going to do a virtual copy just so we preserve the original edits I made because I like where this image is at. If I reset it and tried to just do it off memory, I wouldn't be able to get it exactly <laughs> the same. So I love using these virtual copies as kind of like swatches for other edits mm -hmm. that I could do. And I like using the presets tab on the left here. I've made a bunch of my own presets, but they kind of just act as filters for color treatments. So if I want a warm photo, a cool photo, a purple one, a green one. Uh, so I'll sometimes make a couple of virtual copies and you can do as many as you want because the original raw is still preserved in your catalog. Perfect. So I'll have four virtual copies here and I'll just hover through my uh, presets. And let's say I want a warm shot like this. I'll select that. I'll go over to this one here. I'll do more of like a cool toned one like this. And then I can just tab between, let's say a natural edit, a warm edit or a more cool edit. Mm -hmm. I love that. And then you can see them side by side as well. Mm -hmm. I could even do them in the grid like this. Right. Um, that would be, oh, now we're testing my shortcut knowledge. <laughs> it's not G, is it L for loop? It might be either it's M or N. N. Yes, there we go. Okay, cool. So yeah, we have our uh, side by side. You're gonna get so there, it's fine. Compare <laughs> uh, the looks of these while still preserving all my original edits. Awesome. But I'm gonna reset both of yeah, these. Yeah, I wanna see what it looks like pre. <laughs> so this is the raw image straight out of camera cool. with no editing applied. Amazing. So I mean, already typically, it looks good. <laughs> thank you. Typically in my workflow, the first thing I do, because I like to preserve all of the detail and dynamic range of my images, I'll tend to underexpose as much as I can without losing shadow detail. So you can see in my histogram, this little wave, this little bump is going to be probably my black point, my true black point. So we've preserved all the shadow detail here and we see a lot of it's crunched up the highlights and that's these windows over here. So the first thing I'm going to do is take my highlight slider down a little bit like this and see we've preserved all this detail in the shears here in the windows. Love then that. I'm going to bring my shadow detail up just to make sure I'm getting all the texture out of this hair and a little bit out of the shadow detail of the clothes. So I'm going to pull that slider up 
And then, like I said, with this black point here, whenever I'm doing black and whites, I usually just look at my histogram to make sure that I'm hitting a true black and a true white. So if I want this point to be my true black, I'm going to take the black slider while keeping an eye over here. I'm going to bring my black slider down just until that little peak touches and kisses the left of this histogram. Nice. Now I know that my blacks are at a true point and I'm maximizing the dynamic range of my scene. Same for the whites. These are already pretty much hugging the top. I can even show the clipping here with this. So I think it's in a good spot. There's really no detail here that I need to bring back. So I'm good with that. Awesome. White balance looks pretty good to me, uh, but I do want to make sure that all my verticals are in line. So another go-to is the transform tool down here. Uh, I usually just go straight to verticals. There's not really a true horizontal in the scene because it's a two point perspective. So the camera is looking into a corner. So there's nothing to level out horizontally, but vertically we see these straight lines that we know should be upright. So I'll click the vertical tool and then it automatically straightens all that out for me. I love all the tools, like all the different options that you have in that transform, because then you can kind of like filter through each one and, and see what, what works best. And if I wanted to take a step further, let's say I'm too close to the model at this such a wide angle and I want to make their top half not seem so big compared to the bottom half, I would probably do a manual horizontal transform and just straighten that out so it's a little mm. more of a head-on perspective while keeping the proportions the same. Awesome. But this is a pretty light workload. I'll adjust the contrast down a little bit. I've actually been playing around with low contrast images mm -hmm. um, as a response to like my typically high contrast, high dynamic images. Uh, I want to go for that softer, inviting, warm, welcoming home gym feeling. So I think low contrast is going to be in our best interest here. Yeah, definitely. You kind of have to take into account the, the nature of like what you're photographing. Obviously, you're not going to do the same for like a boxing image in like, you know, <laughs> super like crazy background and everything. Yeah. And since we have a, like a daylit scene, uh, in this case, it's artificially daylit. I actually have some strobes oh, outside the window cool. blasting in um, to so mimic smart. daylight. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm really trying to stage as much as a natural scene, scene as possible. Um, but if it's super bright out, you know, you want the room to be full of light, airy. So lowering that contrast is going to make those shadows really soft and it's going to make it look even more naturally daylit. Yeah, no, that's that's a, such a great um, thing to do because I feel like sometimes homes can can be dark in certain, you know, certain certain homes have just like it's like way too dark for any detail. So having that, um, you know, that light really helps a lot. So in this case, I'm noticing that this side of the frame is a little bit darker than this side of the frame, which makes sense. But I do want to lift this to bring more attention to our subject here and some of the attention away from our windows. So I'm actually going to use the masking tool inside a Lightroom. Nice. And I'm going to do a linear gradient. And I'm going to pull it from the right side of our image towards the left side of our image. And just to show the overlay, this is where it's hitting. So it starts here, kind of falls off around this point. And I'm just going to bring those highlights down even further because I want to bring back some of the detail on the carpet here, some of the detail on her feet, and then just shift more of the focus over here. I want my subject to be not the brightest part of the image, but brighter than most of the things in the image. So our audience pays attention to this. Yeah. So I we're love trying to those like direct, masks. It's great. We're trying to direct attention away from all this nothing over here and more towards what we want. So bringing the highlights down like that, and you can see before and after what we've done so far in Lightroom. Very, very subtle changes, but they will add up over time, especially once we go into Lightroom and keep this going. But I still preserve some of the detail on the carpet here. We can see this texture. We can see the texture of the socks and a little bit more texture outside the window. He so has I've... a question. Daniel, oh, yeah. can you tell us who is your model? <laughs> oh, I'm a model is Kathleen. She is a local oh. uh, trainer in here in Chicago. Amazing. And uh, she is a friend of mine who is kind enough to help lend her image for this stream and this shoot. I love that. So I'm going to now bring this into Photoshop because I think this is treated well in Lightroom. The process, the initial post-processing is done. So I'll right click my thumbnail, go to edit in. And this integration that I was talking about earlier is so convenient. We can just go straight oh, into Photoshop from Lightroom. So I don't need to process this out as a TIFF. I don't need to export it as a PSD. I can just go bam, straight into Photoshop with one button. So now we're here in Photoshop and I'm just gonna dive right into my usual workflow. Let's do it. Um, everything I do is kind of based on actions that I've created for myself with my years of experience in Photoshop. Um, I'm gonna show you guys how quick you can get your files set up for your workflow in Photoshop. 
and it's as easy as one click <laughs> and bam. For those of you who have heard of frequency separation, uh, it can be kind of a pain to set up. Uh, I've spent years manually building frequency separation layers, and it's a little bit of a lengthy process, which <laughs> I can walk through here on stream for you guys just to uh, get everyone on the same page. Yeah, actually, that would be great because I feel like there's some people probably who just are like, don't even want to go in there and, and do, you know, try And I know it, it can be a really scary yeah, thing. It can be intimidating for sure. But just like any other skill, Photoshop is a skill. The more you practice it, the better you are, the faster you are. So. Uh, and there are tools to make things even faster than just muscle memory. So I have an action here that just automatically builds my frequency separation layers. And you can see here, it puts them into this group for me titled frequency separation. I also name all of my layers. That's my biggest tip for anyone who is struggling or is kind of scared of Photoshop is the more you organize your layers, the more you title them and make them clear to what they're doing, the easier it is to learn. So you can see here I have my low frequency layer for tone, my high frequency layer for texture, and then I have a little tonal layer in the middle. And that's not typical for frequency separation. That's something I'll get into in a little bit. Amazing. But for now, the basic explanation of what frequency separation does is that this high, it, it separates tone and texture from your image. So you can edit those independently. So we can see here, we have some skin detail on our model. Normally, if you were to just go off of the background layer and you grab this and you move it somewhere else, you're going to grab that tone and that texture. Or even if I do like a clone stamp tool and set that to current layer, I'm going to grab both the tone and the texture from that area. We don't want that. Right. Even if I'm sampling from other places of skin, that might get messed up if I grab the wrong area of the skin. Then we see right. this texture. We still see the brown from the eyebrows. We don't want that. So this just gives us more control over what we're editing and how we're editing it. So if I open up my group and go to my high frequency texture layer, I'm going to use the patch tool. This is the most common tool that I use for high frequency retouching. So I'll just grab the area of the blemish that I want. I'll move it over to a cleaner sample of skin, and then it replaces that without changing the tone. So I could even uh, grab a larger area and go over to the hair. And you'll see that the color of the skin tone is preserved, but we've huh. brought over the texture of the hair over here. Okay, that's a good that's a good way to show it. <laughs> Same thing is true on the inverse. If I go to tone, I can preserve all of this beautiful skin texture here. And I'll go over to the hair. And suddenly we're just taking the dark parts of the hair. I see. But you can see that we still have all of that texture on top of it. So those are two independent isolated features. That's very cool. So to walk you through how I would go about using this, uh, it's very simple. I use the patch tool for the high frequency. I'll use, sometimes I'll use the patch tool. Sometimes I'll use the mixer brush tool for low. So we'll start with high and I'll just go after those super obvious blemishes and I'll just grab them, sample from a cleaner source. You can even do it in the hair as well for those stray hairs. Like I have a flyaway right here. I'm just gonna grab that, move that over. Grab that, move that over. Same thing outside of the face. Move it over, move it over. And then that's a little before and after of what we got going on here. Nice. So normally I would just walk around the face, grabbing blemishes as I see, but still kind of balancing out the natural ones. So a couple of things that I don't edit are beauty marks or uh, birthmarks, unless specifically requested to. Um, something like this is just a small pimple. So I'm just going to move that right, over. Right, something that'll like disappear in like a week and a half. <laughs> yeah, then my, my, and with retouching, there are a lot of like ethical quandaries with that. But my personal policy is I feel comfortable editing things that can be changed on set, either through makeup, lighting, posing, or styling. So things that we could fix in camera that we just didn't catch, I have no problem retouching. Yeah. So even this here, I'm gonna move that over because you want to go for blemishes that can be distracting like keeping some skin texture here is perfectly fine but when it comes to something that's so close to the eye that can be a little distracting because you're uh you're going to immediately want to look towards the eyes of the subject so anything that's close to here i'm probably going to get rid of but something like a little bit of blotchiness here or even some of the texture in the cheek we want to keep that to keep it natural so i'm not going to touch that too much or even like a birthmark up here, I have no problem leaving this in. It helps keep the image real and believable. Yeah. But a flyaway hanging off the edge here, 
I'm just going to get rid of that because we could have just tucked that into the pony or hairsprayed it down. That's not an issue. Yeah. I have a question for you. What makes like retouching for like fitness or health um, photography, like what makes it different from other types? Like what, what, what do you think is like, makes it different? I think with any genre of photography, um, the industry is looking for different things. So just like the fashion and beauty world, uh, we've shifted away from like airbrushing basically since mm -hmm. the 2000s. And now we're looking for like that uh, Haley Bieber, perfect but natural skin mm -hmm. where you want to see texture and you want to see a couple blemishes, but it still looks clean and like a little like wet in the beauty world. Yeah, dewy. <laughs> dewy, yeah. Um, and then in fitness, I noticed that a lot of the looks lend themselves to very orange and cyan color palettes. Very yeah. low contrast is pretty in right now. So back in like the mid 2010s, uh, high contrast, crunchy, grainy textured images that show intensity were really popular. And now we're moving towards uh, more of a look like this, where it's like relatable, natural, clean, yeah. low contrast, approachable. I think that just came with the big wave of like, people were getting interested in fitness after the pandemic. So we yeah. want to make it relatable. I bet it also probably has to do with like the UGC kind of like, you know, wave of like everything being just real and like, you know, being, it oh, is what totally. it is, especially with like TikTok and, and Instagram reels. So I'm just flying around, just cleaning up a couple Thanks. small blemishes, um, but I'm going to leave the general tone of this fine because we also do want that definition. And that's another thing that kind of makes fitness different is like, sometimes like shadows in weird places uh you don't want that in like a fashion shoot but in the fitness world you want as much contrast as possible in that muscle definition you want to kind of show right. uh the muscles that people really worked hard for yeah definitely so best example here like these quads are beautiful in a fashion shoot they'd be like oh it's a wrinkle or a fold we want to smooth that right. out to make the clothes look good but in this case since we want to make the model look appealing we want to show off those quads that you worked hard for Right. Yeah, no, that's a good point. <laughs> uh, Peter says, hello, Daniel. And then he says, this guy is fast. <laughs> and that's the name of the game today is working very quickly inside of Photoshop. Um, exactly. I've been doing this for a long time. So it's honestly retouching is pretty therapeutic to me because it's literally just step yeah. and repeat, just flying around the image, grabbing stuff. And you're using a, a little pen, right? Yes, or like I am using a Wacom tablet with a stylus. I use the... Nice small one um and then i just have like a really high sensitivity it lets me move around the screen really fast while doing like yeah. minimal wrist movement no that's great i love that so a good uh example here for the tone layer the low frequency is we've cleaned up the texture on the fuzzies on this legging mm -hmm. uh, but we still see this little bright spot of the fuzzies because we can see the color and the tone of it so i'm going to use still use the patch tool on my tone layer and you can see here the tone is just kind of like a blurred layer so we don't get any of that texture. I'm going to grab this white area on the legging and then bring that down to match the rest around I it. See. And now okay. that's been smoothed out. Cool. No, I love so that. that's about all the retouching I'm going to do on our subject for now, just so we can move on. So once I'm done with frequency separation, on top of that, I'm going to make a new layer. And I always title that layer cleanup. And that is just a blank, empty layer. And we're going to do edits on top of our image now. So okay. I like using the spot healing brush tool. Uh, it says it right there, removes marks and <laughs> blemishes. I like to set it to normal mode. I like to leave the type on content to wear fill. And then since we're working on an empty layer on top of our document, we still want it to source what's around it to blend it. So I will check this button that says uh, samples clone data from composited data. Basically means samples from all layers below. Mm -hmm. um, on a Mac, this is not a button. I think it's a drop down and you can just click sample all layers. Yes. So what I like to do when I'm shooting in a home environment, I just go straight for all the outlets and switches. So I like to just grab that, paint over it, and it's gone. Nice. And you can kind of dial it in as much as you want, brush over a couple of times, but at full view, this is a seamless transition for me. I love that. Another one is this switch right here. I'll just get rid of that. Bam, gone. Now this home <laughs> looks more clean. And then sometimes there are details, like if you're doing a lifestyle shoot, you want as little branding as possible. That's so correct. let's say these weights had logos on them that didn't match the client that we were shooting for. I can very easily just brush over those and they are gone and it'll match all the data that's around it and trying to use like content to where to guess what's supposed to go there. 
and it does a pretty good job for the most part yeah. and it's really improved over the years i love that i'm curious have you tried the remove tool as well i have not been playing with the remove tool it's mostly because <laughs> when i am trying to clean stuff up mm -hmm. i have a very targeted idea of what i want it to be replaced with so right. things like content to wear fill fit better because it allows me to control what it's sampling from instead of sure, letting photoshop sure. do all the guesswork that makes sense um also in the chat people are having a whole discussion about socks right now <laughs> the, oh. <laughs> about the fitness model wearing socks and they're like wait <laughs> why is she wearing socks i had photoshop them out <laughs> but penny's like there are also socks with grippies on the bottom um that help for mat exercises so it could be those which that probably is what it is <laughs> I'm just going to chalk it up to maybe it was a little cold inside that thing. Yeah. <laughs> um, got the air conditioning blasting. Yeah. So for something like this, I would initially try to use spot healing tool, but in my tests, I found that it actually didn't do the best job because we're working with a complex gradient and a lot of textures around the area. So that's not necessarily a clean and believable result. What I, my new go-to is, is if that doesn't work, I will grab the area with a pen tool. So I'll just do a really quick pen grab. Nice. <laughs> and then and I says, will... there's a studio chain called Pure Bar and you wear the sticky socks. That's right. There it there are it's there's actually it's one right down the street from my house. <laughs> nice. So in a complex cleanup situation, I am going to make a selection of the area that I want to get rid of, and I'm gonna use Photoshop's new generative fill tool. Amazing. And you can access this by making a selection and right-clicking. You can also access it under the edit tab. Um, and for this, if I just want it to get rid of it, do something on its own, I don't have to type in a prompt. I'm just going to click generate. I love it. I wonder actually how the remove tool would do with this too. I can test that out actually. Yeah, you should. I think it would be, it's always good. I feel like that's the, like when it's co like complex like this, you kind of have to try a few different things. Hey, so that's pretty with good. With generative fill, uh, it does a good job of contextualizing the objects that are around it instead of just the textures. So Photoshop recognizes that this is a table and this is a table that's stacked up against itself in layers. And this is the um, nice. like center column. So it's done a good job of matching that this is this side of a table. This is this side of a table and it's blending across the table, recognizing this is all one continuous object. Yeah, so it did awesome. a fantastic job with that. Um, when I do generative fills, if it's for this cleanup purpose, I'll actually delete the mask that it generates and then I'll just merge it with my cleanup layer, keeping everything still in one layer. And then I'll have to rename this again to cleanup. That organization is always important. Yes. So now when you see my cleanup layer, it's still just the elements that I worked on independently all nice. in one layer. And then I can turn that off and on and do a before and after. Oh, I love that. But I want to test your theory about the eraser tool. Yeah, I'm curious too, because uh, I feel like it's really, really good but there are times where the texture looks a little off. And so I would have to like go back in with some like patch patch tool situation. But I mean, I'm curious too. I'm actually, yeah, because there's so much going on. I feel like there's the gradient of like the shadow to light on the table. So I'm gonna have to go find that tool really quick because oh. <laughs> I have a very customized um, workspace that, that only sense. has the stuff that I use regularly. <laughs> I love that. Um, Peter says generative fill is perfect for this kind of thing. I 100% agree. <laughs> the magic eraser tool? Um, I think it's the remove tool. It's It might be. Um, there it is. There it is. There you go. Perfect. Cool. All right. So we're going to grab the remove tool and do a test. Is this like a... Okay, cool. So remove. And it'll like stroke. look pink, I cool. think, too. Oh, fun. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Let's see if this. Oh, so I'd have to do it on a oh, pixel layer. So, OK, that's good to know. So, so because you're doing it on that. I'm going to duplicate my frequency separation and just merge it into a uh, merged full image layer. Yeah. And now we can do it on top of this. Nice. Yeah, it sometimes it takes a little bit, too, but. Oh, yeah, it was perfect. Right? I mean, it's not bad. And then you can just go over it again with like, yeah. you can even continue like going into it. And then if you were like, if you really zoom in, you can see a little bit of the texture is a little funky, but I mean, it does a pretty but good at job. Full view, that's perfect. I mean, between this and this, yeah, yeah. very similar results. Yeah. Love, I love it. it. 
no, I'm glad you, I'm glad you tested it. <laughs> so when it comes to frequency separation, I, I think I'm done with cleanup for now. There's really not a whole lot going on in this image for me to adjust. Uh, it's a pretty simple frame. But another thing that frequency separation is great for, most people think it's just for skin. It's great for clothing retouching. It's also great for texture and material retouching. So we have our mat here and we've been shooting for a while. So we got a little bit of sweat on it. We got a little rug texture. Frequency separation is great for cleaning this kind of stuff up. So if I zoom in and I just want to get rid of all the fuzzies, I can do it. And the simpler the object, the better this works actually because i can just sample from anywhere on this mat and it'll do a fantastic job i love that that's a good tip because i feel like i normally assume that frequency separation is for skin i know some people have like used it for like product retouching and like high like super commercial advertising kind of stuff but yeah i'm like this is great normally i like to zoom in super close and get all the details because I'm a perfectionist like that. But when it comes <laughs> to something simple like this mat, I can do a massive chunk and just grab anywhere and it'll uh, keep that uniform texture going. Yeah. Awesome. So to bring tone into this, some things, the more you practice it, the more you'll recognize what issue is based on texture and what issues are based on tone. So for something like this, I would say this is a combination. I can see this hard contrast line here. So I know that's gonna be a texture issue to blend that out. But we still see that dark spot and that dark spot is gonna be our tone. So I can just go on my tone layer, same thing, grab the lasso tool, move it somewhere else. Wow, that's awesome. And now that spot is a little more. So I can do these gigantic grabs to make this <laughs> mat as smooth as possible. We love that. I even see like this dark spot and this light spot and grab both of those at the same time and just sample from a cleaner part of the mat. Amazing. That looks really, really good so far. And then cleaning up the texture of the same area. Love it. And there you go. Awesome. That looks Got really great. Got rid of all those blemishes on our mat. I love it. Wow. It, guys, if you are just joining us now, we are here with Daniel Livingstone. He is sharing all of his favorite uh, techniques for streamlining your photo editing workflow. And he's got this really fun uh, shoot that he did for, you know, just fitness, health, recovery, and it's it's great. So it's just showing us all the tips and tricks, especially as uh, the frequency separation is so smart, honestly. I feel like I need to use it more. <laughs> so to explain this tonal part that I said I would get into later, I promised. Um, this tonal layer is how I do dodging and burning. So the common way that uh, a lot of beginners and intermediates learn how to do dodging and burning is through curves layers, but those are two different layers. They have masks. You have to adjust them independently. Uh, it can be kind of a tricky process and it's not simplified. So with this tonal layer, uh, this breaks everything down into one layer. You can do both. And there's a really quick way to work on this. So uh, this layer itself is a 50% gray layer, flat, and it's set to a soft light blending mode. And what I like to do is I like to use the just regular brush tool and I'll set my swatches to primary being a light skin tone based on the subject. And I can sample around the subject to get those values. And then a, a secondary dark tone. So I'll try to find the darkest skin tone on the subject and go from there. Uh, I also use Photoshop's swatches panel uh, a lot and I have skin swatches just preset so I can just grab that, invert, grab that. And now my two swatches are my favorite skin tones to use for uh, dodging and burning. Nice. So with this tonal layer, since it's a soft light gray layer, it actually doesn't change my image at all. If I turn it off and on, you'll notice there's no change. And I set it in between high and low because if I'm dodging and burning, I'm usually dodging and burning tone, not texture. So we're still keeping it underneath the texture. So we're kind of painting underneath the texture of the skin. Think of it like Got makeup. It. So I when I'm working that. on this, I set my opacity pretty low, like about a 20. And then I set my flow low pretty well also at 20. And then if I start painting, you'll notice that it's a very, very subtle change. But if I do enough strokes, it'll add up. And then you'll notice when I do before and after, we've painted those shadows out. Nice. It's an extremely subtle way to do dodging and burning on skin. So for this shadow here in the nose, if I want to even out this T-zone, all I have to do is just kind of paint over the T-zone where I see the shadowy parts. 
and you just kind of add up those brush strokes, let them compound over time. This is why we're doing a low opacity and a low flow. We want to take very subtle steps and not heavy handed airbrush it all at once. <laughs> True. And having that blending mode too at soft light really helps to kind of keep it um, very subtle. So if I do before and after this, you can see that T-zone is a lot more smooth, but in a very subtle way. Yeah, definitely. Ooh, we have a question. Peter says, Daniel, do clients ever make unrealistic requests? I once did a print ad that had candles floating in a pool and their naturally yellow glow. The client wanted a neutral blue, which didn't look natural. And in the end, it looked crappy and over retouched. <laughs> so in a situation with, this is a very specific answer, but with candles yeah. <laughs> and color correction and unrealistic, I would go straight to the generative fill tool for that, honestly, because <laughs> yeah. I've noticed when it generates candles, it doesn't necessarily always account for like glow and color cast, but the candles look realistic. So I always shoot in a pool and just generative fill a bunch of candles into the scene and they wouldn't have cast, but they would look realistic. Yeah, definitely. That's awesome. And yeah, I mean, do your clients ever make unrealistic requests? I think those um, are questions. <laughs> Not necessarily. I mean, when it comes to expectations with a client, especially those conversations are always had before pre-production or in pre-production before we even totally. take the first picture, there are a lot of emails, a lot of meetings, a lot of treatments, a lot of presentations, just making sure that we're all on the same page about exactly what we're going to create. Especially if we have a strict timeline, we cannot waste time experimenting or wondering or second guessing. We walk into the first day of shoot knowing exactly how many shots we need to create and of what. Yeah. Totally. So with this tonal dodging and burning, it's just a series of very subtle um, changes that compound to make a very dramatic look um, of little secret special sauce tool that I have <laughs> uh, that I like to tell retouchers about is called a solar curve. Um, in the film world, it's called false color, but solar curve sounds way cooler. <laughs> um, and it is just a curves layer. And you can see here, I've just jacked those anchor points up and down top to bottom about six or seven times. And it has a crazy effect on your image when you turn this layer on and it kind of makes it like this rainbowy <laughs> effect. Wow. Um, this obviously doesn't go into the actual edit or the final image, but what it does is it allows me to see skin detail a lot clearer than without it. Mm -hmm. So. You have to kind of get used to looking at a photo this way. I spend a lot of time looking at these kinds of solar curves, but if I'm trying to target an area and I see, oh, there's a little bit of a shadow under the eye that I want to correct through dodging and burning, I'll turn on my solar curve and I can see here that shadow area is represented by green. And then the surrounding skin tone is represented by blue. So I know that this is the area I need to target and I can see that a lot clearer. Mm. So while the solar curve is on, this is just kind of like a visual aid. I'll go to my tonal layer to dodge and burn, do my, uh, my light skin tone, low opacity, low flow. And I'll start with the solar curve on painting on this tonal layer. So it's just showing me what my edits are doing. And it's a lot easier to see those dodging and burning edits with this filter on. Sure. So then I'll paint on top of that until the green starts to match the blue around it. Then I know I've smoothed out that shadow. That's such a good like little uh, tip for being able to visualize it. So now when I turn that solar curve off, you can see the before and after the tonal, the shadow is just a little bit lighter. Yeah. And now it blends in with the skin around it. That looks great. So that's usually how I do my dodging and burning and my like high level skin retouching. It's just a lot of this painting the skin and using solar curves to actually see the detail in which I need to work on. And how much, like how, um, far do you go with it? I feel like you can look at that and be like, oh my God, I have so much to do, but you kind of like, yeah. How do you decide? I have gotten lost. And especially early on when I was learning how to do this <laughs> technique, there are times where I've spent like 10 hours editing a single image because I get way <laughs> too zoomed in and I start de editing every single detail. Right. Right. Um, it is a skill. It takes time to learn. And what really helps is taking breaks. So if I'm retouching an image, uh, for too long. Sometimes I'll just have to walk away from my computer, do something else for a little bit, even if it's just five minutes and come back to my screen with fresh eyes. And then when yeah. I sit down, I'll zoom all the way out, look at the entire image and I'll go, oh, that actually looks kind of fake or I went a little too hard on that. And then I'll toggle some before and afters, you know, and I'll be like, oh yeah, maybe that was a little too heavy handed. <laughs> that makes so sense. So it's all about taking breaks. Fresh eyes are huge when it comes to retouching. And even like 
exporting, showing it to a friend and be like, do you notice anything weird about it? If they say no, then it's a believable edit. Yeah. No, I love that. I love that answer. Thank you. Yeah, Jeff, sorry. I totally asked your question personally before I even saw your comment, <laughs> but they're like asking, do you ever go too far with retouching and lose some humanity slash interest? <laughs> well, All I the think time. he answered it. <laughs> no, it is, it is a tough balance. Um, yeah. I think uh, constant evaluation of your own work, lots of feedback from people that you trust, um, even like doing like portfolio reviews with experts or reaching out to retouchers, just having them critique your work can be really helpful. Um, but yeah, it is uh, easy to get lost in it while you're working on it all the yeah. time. Even with color, sometimes I'm like trying to edit a specific color. I'm like, oh, it's too bright. It's too dark. It's too saturated. It's not. And then I walk away and I go, oh, it's fine the whole time. Yeah, right. <laughs> sometimes you just need to step away. <laughs> mm -hmm. Now, I love this solar curve, um, you know, technique or tip, you know, for like seeing things, even just to, like as a guide, as a starting point. I can know? even mix it with my frequency separation technique. If I'm really looking to truly clean up all the texture in this mat, I can see right. this little fuzzy here that really sticks out at you. And sometimes it's just hard to see details and things that yeah. are pretty uniformly toned, like when it comes to a flat blue mat or even like skin tone, it's just like shades of pink and yellow on top of itself. It's hard to see the complexity, totally. but it really is all there. Yeah, that's awesome. And then once again, to, to build these solar curves for yourself, it's literally just creating a curves layer and then jacking the anchor points to max and min X amount of times. You can make a bunch of different solar curves. Uh, if I wanted to make a new fresh one for myself that looks a little different, I can do less or more anchor points. So we're gonna do this with like a couple less anchor points. We'll just do like a light one. So that's what? four anchor points sure. and we're still seeing like oh this is a shadow area this is a highlight area so maybe this shadow is something i want to clean up in my tonal so i'll turn that on and then i'll just brush over a couple yeah. times i'm gonna go pretty heavy in it with this just for the example <laughs> so i brushed over that a bunch of times but with still a subtle brush turn that off and then do before and after suddenly yeah. that's blended there you out go. Nice. So that pretty much covers everything that I have to say on like hardcore retouching for now. Uh, in the next image we work on, I'll do that uh, walkthrough of how to build frequency separation. Awesome. Um, Jeff, and then when it comes to my curve tip is really, really useful. Thank you. <laughs> oh, of course. Happy to help. Um, so when it comes to workflow, uh, I always start with the retouching. You want all of your pixel based layers at the bottom and all of your adjustments at the top because adjustments can always be changed. But if your pixel layers are based on adjustments, you can never go back and change those adjustments. So anything involving like duplicated layers or um, uh, clone stamping or spot healing, anything that generates new pixels in your image, uh, I always have at the bottom. And then everything on top will play off of that. So anything like a hue saturation layer, a levels curve, uh, all that will go on top. Yeah, definitely. Uh, Michael says, wow, solar curve is new to me. Do you have any recommendations where I can learn more? Um, I actually <laughs> didn't pick up solar curves from any online resources. So I don't know if there's anyone online talking about it, um, but it really is uh, as simple as just making a curves layer and experimenting. So yeah. uh, just like this, make a curves layer, just take your anchor points to the top and the bottom of that curve and just do it like as many times as you want, kind of experiment with different looks because uh, different placements of these anchor points will show you different areas of information. Sometimes right. if I'm working on a spot and I'm like, oh, I'm not seeing enough detail here, I can always just go in and move these anchor points over a little bit and that'll reveal different texture to me. Sure. No, that makes sense. So just go into Photoshop, drop a curves layer and just experiment. Cool. Thank you. So I'm going to group these layers together. And I love using groups in Photoshop. It helps keep things so organized for me. And sometimes when I'm working with other people on the same document, if I need to pass this along to someone else to help me edit it, um, just making it as easy as possible for anyone else to open this document and know what everything is doing makes things so much easier. So they can open this document, see a retouching group, see a cleanup layer, see a frequency separation yeah. group inside of that. Know that this is one's for high, this one's for low, this one's for tonal. And then on top of my retouching group, I'm going to start doing my adjustment layers. So I think the overall look and feel of this is I want to go for a orange and cyan look because it's really popular right now. 
but I want to keep it bright and airy and still natural. So I'm going to start by doing a hue and saturation layer. Hey, awesome. Also, Keys just commented unofficially at a VFX studio I worked at. It was called Predator Vision in reference That's to the movie. That's hilarious. That's amazing. <laughs> predator vision that's so good <laughs> i think that's so funny but if anyone on set heard me talking about predator vision they'd start getting really nervous i know um so yeah to get that orange and cyan look we basically we basically just need to move all of our warm tones towards orange and all of our cool tones towards cyan so uh everything on the top half like green and up is going to be warm everything green and below is going to be cool so my reds i'm going to move a little bit down towards orange my nice. yellows, I'm going to move to the left. And then my blues, I'm going to move to the left to cool them out towards cyan. Magentas, I'm going to pull actually to the right. So my division point is probably going to be magenta is warm and then blue is cool. So we're going to go opposite directions from there. Okay. I'm just going to dial in the exact colors I want. So we moved everything kind of over towards where we want it. In addition, I'm going to use a curves layer to further dial in the uh, color grading of the scene. So I want to go for actually a matted out look. So we're going to matte the blacks, matte the whites. So I'm going to create an anchor point close to white in my curves layer. I'm going to bring the true white point down a little bit and then same on the other end. So I'm going to do an anchor point close to black. I'm going to bring our black point up a little bit and this will matte out those blacks. This will matte out those whites and make everything look a little smoother. Ooh, yeah, I like that. To take oh, that a great. step further for color grading, I'm going to go into the blue curve and we're going to do the exact same process. Anchor point towards the top, bring the top down, and then on the bottom, dial that back, bring that one up. Nice. And then I'll do an anchor in the center to keep the neutrals where they are. And then just a little bit further, same thing in the reds. I'm going to pull some of the red, it's actually going to be the opposite direction, so I'm going to pull red into the highlights anchor the mid-tones, and then I'll pump a little bit of cyan into the shadows. Not a lot, though. I don't awesome. want this taking over. <laughs> I know, it's crazy how just even like a little movement can make such a big difference in the color. I'm gonna bring this down a little bit too, just put more yellow into those highlights. And that is roughly our like orange and cyan, like cinematic tone, color toning. Yeah. So this whole stream is going to be out making things fast in Photoshop. I know we've like 30, 40 minutes in and we've only edited <laughs> one picture, but this is how you maximize the workflow. I like to front load all of my retouching. So every edit and decision I want to make, I figure out on the first shot and everything after that is just copying and applying. So yeah. If it takes you one hour to edit the first image, it'll take maybe another hour just to do all the rest. Yeah, that's great. So we have our two layers here for curves and hue and saturation. I'm gonna call this color grade and I'm gonna call this uh, orange cyan. I'm gonna group those into our adjustments group. So we're keeping our layers organized and I can turn these on and off and we can see we did our image. Oh, so nice. now we that have that really great. beautiful color grade going on. Mm -hmm. So we want to keep things still looking natural, right? And approachable. This plant looks super not right in our scene. <laughs> so one of my favorite new Photoshop tools is this object selection oh tool. Oh my gosh, yes. I love this thing. So good. Um, my go-to before this was always the quick selection tool, but sometimes that was a little hard. And if the quick selection couldn't do it, I would always go to the color range. And even then that kind of started grabbing a bunch of stuff in my scene that I didn't want. This is a great tool because it can, it does a really good job of isolating exactly the thing you want in the area that it exists in and nothing outside of that. So, um, when you have this tool, my tip is to always go to the background layer or whatever the highest pixel layer is. Um, because we can't do this on an empty layer. I won't know what to grab. Right. So. I'm just going to show the background layer just to show the audience that we are working on this. And I'm going to use this object selection tool. And it's kind of like a marquee tool where you just grab a selection area. And I'm just going to highlight over the entire object I want to grab, which is this plant. And it does a fantastic oh, so job good. grabbing that outline. So if I turn all my adjustments back on, this plant looks a little dead. So we want to bring some life back <laughs> into that. So I'm going to do a human saturation layer. And it 
builds that mask. If we have the selection and we just click an adjustment layer, it'll just build the mask off of that selection. So we have this layer and I want to target the yellows and I want to move them towards green to just bring that plant back to life. Oh yeah, that looks already so much better. <laughs> and that is the object that. selection tool. But now we can take this anywhere we want. So let's say I want to really match the palette and this maroon isn't really fitting with my color palette that I'm going for. We can do some pretty large scale selections with this tool. So oh, I'm so going good. to do, and you kind of have to like shape it out since this is a square, kind of have to yeah. go to the farthest edge and look at like, draw like an invisible square around the entirety of the image and go, okay, I kind of have to start like here. And then I'm just going to highlight this entire top. I'm going for this top, not the skin. And cool. Photoshop knows that because it's detecting an object and it'll grab this outfit. Now I grabbed a little bit of the skin here, but that's okay. Cause I can just refine this mask further using my trusted mm -hmm. quick selection tool. And I'm just gonna do a negative selection and I'm just gonna grab that out of it. So I don't know if you've uh, discovered this. I literally was probably like a month old before I found out that you could actually change the way that you select the object selection tool from like a, you know, the square to like a little lasso tool. There's oh, like really? a little mode. Yeah. I don't know if you uh, saw that or I wonder if it's it out, the but old it's key. amazing. I'm um, going to have to experiment with that on this. Yeah. Stream. Experiment or maybe do the pants after and just, and you can still uh, switch the mode. Cause it is awesome. just, it has changed the game because I'm, I, I also did that thing where I'm like, okay, I have to do a square. So I have to like kind of make it in the same area, you know? So I have my section of the top. It. I'm going to do a hue saturation layer. And I'm just going to grab the master uh, color selection and I'm just going to move that over until I get Ooh. to a shade of blue that I want. That's awesome. And then that was all just done with one wow. lasso click. And we have a perfect mask. I can even show the mask here. That is an insanely detailed mask. Seriously. Ugh. Photoshop is just so good. <laughs> and then you can see before and after here and at full view. It. It's a seamless mask. So good. So I think this shot is in a good place. I'm going to start using some other images as examples of what's coming up. So we're going to go back to our Lightroom catalog and I'm going to go to my next shot here. This one's already been kind of processed in the way that I want it. So I can just take it straight into Photoshop. I love her little smile. So precious. And uh, the way that I got this processing just to make things once again, quick and efficient, I can just Right click the first image that we worked on in Lightroom. I can go to the develop settings and I can copy those settings. Uh, awesome. The keyboard shortcut for this is also um, Control Shift C or uh, Command Shift C on Mac. And then when you go to paste, it's uh, Command Shift V or Control Shift V and uh, develop settings, paste settings. And then it gives you a um, Normally it gives you a dialog window of like which settings you want to copy and which ones you want to paste. So if I do copy, we get the, we can check mm. which tool we want to pull from. So if I don't want the same curves layer from this and the other one, if it's different lighting. Uh, I don't have to select that. That's great. That makes it so much easier. <laughs> I'm gonna have to turn my camera brightness down just a little bit. <laughs> the sun really the sun came, came out came and I was not <laughs> expecting it to at all. Um, um, so yeah. When we're talking about workflow efficiency, we want to grab uh, the first image, put all the work into that, getting this dialed in and every single little detail we want. Then we just copy and paste settings, copy, paste settings, copy and paste across the shoot. And we can kind of do the same thing in Photoshop. So with, um, no, I'm going to get into that later. We got to do this in the right order. <laughs> Let's talk about building frequency separation. It's kind of complicated. This is pre-recorded. You can go back and rewatch it. Yes. But yes. the first thing you're going to do is duplicate your image and then duplicate it a second time. You can do that by right clicking and duplicating. The keyboard shortcut is um, control J or command J. We're going to turn off that top layer. And then with that bottom layer, we're going to put a Gaussian blur on it. Now there's a lot of debate over like, what the right How setting much? for this radius <laughs> is. Um, one thing that I've heard is just start blurring it until you just barely see the texture disappear, like those fine textures. So this is with uh, none of it on, and I'm just gonna keep going up, up, up. And about there, we kind of lose some of the skin detail. I could probably go a little further. Um, my safe area is anywhere between like six and nine pixels. Nice. So I'm just gonna do eight. 
and then always title our layers. So we're going to title that uh, low frequency. Awesome. Tone just to help me remember that that's what that's for. The top one, I can just title that now. High frequency. So now we can turn on our top layer and then we're going to go to image, apply image. And then these settings have to be very specific. The document or the source is going to be this Photoshop file. That's the file name there. So you know you're on the right document. The layer, you're going to sample from the low frequency. The channel is going to stay RGB. The blending mode is going to be subtract. Your opacity will be 100. Your scale is going to be 2 and 128. Now I could get into like how the math of that works, but that's not necessarily important. <laughs> All you need to know is two and 128 for scale and offset. Click awesome. okay. And you'll notice that it's this weird gray, like texture layer. This is how we extract all the texture. So it's basically saying from what this layer is, we're going to take everything that it is not, which is the texture. So we're subtracting that makes sense. the tone from the texture. So to turn all these back on, we're going to change the blending mode of our high frequency layer to linear light. And now you notice that the image seems unchanged. I'm even going to group these layers together. And you can see they're both on and active. But if I turn that group on and off, there's no change in our image. So we haven't actually modified our picture yet. We've just isolated the elements into two groups. And when they're stacked on top of each other, they're lining up the tone and the texture perfectly to create our original image. So if I turn the texture off, you'll see the tone. If I turn the tone off, you'll just see the texture oh, that on top sense. of our background wow. layer. That's awesome. Cool. So that is our frequency separation setup. Awesome. Now, and then I you had that to, tonal uh, one, right, too? Yeah. So for me personally, you can do tonal on top of that. So I'll do it. I'll create a new layer. Uh, you can find that uh, here at this plus box icon in the bottom right corner of your screen under layers panel. Or you can just do control shift N is the keyboard shortcut or command shift N. Uh, I always title that tonal. And you can kind of set this stuff up in advance. Uh, the fastest way to do it is to change the blending mode to soft light while creating the new layer. And then you can check this box. It says fill with soft light, neutral color, 50% gray. So checking this box automatically fills it with that gray for nice. you, which is really convenient. So you could do this on top of your frequency separation and it'll have the same effect, but I find that the changes are more subtle uh, when you put it in between these two layers. Sure. So this is how sense. I always set up my frequency separation. And I can delete all this because uh, I've created an action for it. And if you're unfamiliar with Photoshop actions, it's basically recording while you're working and then just redoing all the steps once you're done recording. So I have clicked record, done those exact steps, stopped recording, and then I built this little action for me for frequency separation. So all I have to do is play it and then it just builds those layers for me automatically. I love that. That's so great. <laughs> and uh, the same is true for a lot of things in workflow. For that solar layer, I said, right, make the curve layer jacket up and down. Uh, I had an action that just builds that layer. So if I click this solar action, play, there it is. Our solar layer is right there. Love it. Now in Photoshop's uh, latest update, they've introduced a great feature for uh, beginners and intermediates that is basically actions, but doesn't require all the hard work of recording because recording an action can be kind of difficult. The specific order in which you do things really matters. And if you're trying to create a layer template for yourself, things can get uh, messed up pretty easily in the order of operations. Yeah, it can get pretty tricky. <laughs> So uh, I like the classic adjustments view, but in your adjustments panel, if you right click this icon and do the modern view, this is what your adjustments tab should look like if you have the latest version. So you can see here, put that back. you can see here we have adjustment presets now. So um, if you wanna do a color grade layer using some curves like we did in our previous document, like our color grade and our orange and cyan, we can now select these two layers and we can even create, we have our own presets. We can create a new preset for ourselves that saves the values of all these adjustment layers, create a new preset for ourselves, And wow. then that will save it in this dialog box over here under your presets. Now in a new document, if we click, I've already made uh, the preset for myself here. Um, 
this orange and cyan matte look, which is the color grading and the hue set layer that we made in the previous document. If I just click that, it'll build those two layers out. And now we have our color grade on this image that matches the previous one. Okay. Wow. That's yeah. Makes it so much easier. <laughs> so it puts all of your adjustments into a new group. It titles them, whatever you title them in the preset tab. And then it puts a white mask over it. Awesome. So knowing when to use which tool is really important, especially when it comes to workflow. So uh, adjustment presets are pretty good for like global edits when you want an adjustment to be on the entirety of the image. They do have applications for local things. So when we did our um, color change of the top here, um, that was in this layer. So it's just these hue saturation values. I can make this adjustment layer a preset for myself. And I did title the outfit color and that C changes the entire image in a dramatic mm. way. But <laughs> yeah. that's because this layer is meant to be isolated with a mask in a particular region. So on our new document, I can still do that. I can do our outfit color preset that we made in the last document, which is supposed to change the outfit to blue. And you can see it is working there. So that's this hue saturation layer. I can even change that um, top color. Actually gonna take that out of the group. I love that. And then now all you have to do is just kind of mask. Or so now I just have to mask that. this yeah. layer in. Yeah, awesome. so I'm gonna invert this mask. I'm using uh, control I to do that. And I'm gonna go back into our wonderful little uh, object selection tool. The best. <laughs> so uh, let's say you have an object that's kind of separated by an element. Let's say this is the top, but this is also the top and the straps are. If I just highlight the top from here, it will grab it, but only in this area. And we need this to be a continuous selection across these straps. So when you're using the object selection tool, if it didn't do enough of it for you, you can hold down the shift key and you can add selections to that and then grab other objects and it'll group it in with it. Love so now it. I grab the strap. I have this still selected and I just want to grab this strap as well. So I'm holding nice. the shift key and adding these selections to it. And then I can just mask that in. And now our top is blue. I love it. Oh my gosh, so good. <laughs> and then you can see here, this is the mask that was created just from three clicks. Wow. Back I in the day, if you wanted a pen it. tool this, that would be <laughs> so complicated having to get in here, get all the bends I mean, right. seriously. <laughs> so yeah. I love it. Thanks for showing us. Um, of course. We've got a few people that have joined us in the chat. Hi, Sean. Thanks for being here. Uh, tuning in from Munich. That's amazing. <laughs> Uh, yeah, we're here with Daniel Livingstone. He's sharing all of his favorite techniques and tips for streamlining your photo editing workflow. So we got into some frequency separation, building that out, um, which you could totally then record in, uh, in Photoshop Actions. But then we've also got these fun adjustments that you can now pre make your own presets of and be able to apply easily. So we were able to change that, uh, you know, that top there, the fitness top uh, from a different color to this one blue, which totally matches like the the matte too. <laughs> I can even probably just like float these documents out so you can see them side by side. Yeah, I love that. And thank you, Keith. Yes, there, this is a great chance to request the Photoshop team to add this as its own tool feature or just anything. If you guys have any requests or ideas, like always drop them in the chat. Um, we are always listening. <laughs> So now you can see here, we have uh, two documents that are independently retouched, but still match the same uh, color pattern, same color grading, same local adjustments. And they were done pretty quickly. I didn't have to use the pen tool to manually mask anything. I didn't have to create new layers and then go copy settings or numbers over. It's just as simple between my documents to use this adjustment presets uh, tab, as well as my actions. Yeah, that's awesome. And these are the things that will automate your workflow to make things super quick. So you can see here, these two images match, but we did all the color grading in Photoshop. Normally you'd only be able to do this in Lightroom by just copy and batch applying settings. Now we have tools in Photoshop that allow us to, before we color grade, uh, take our image into Photoshop and then match those edits across multiple documents. Uh, because I don't know about you, but in the past, I've definitely run into situations where it's like, oh, I want to color grade it so bad but I can't do any of that until I go into Photoshop and do all the retouching. Because if I ever wanted to change the yep. color grading after the retouching, I'd have to start completely from scratch because all the retouching is based on that on that yeah. color profile. Totally. 
Joshua says, back when I was doing this work, we didn't have the object selection tool. Oh, I love <laughs> the object selection tool. We just spent too many tool. hours making detailed selections by hand. <laughs> yep. I mean, the lasso tool, really close, 200% yes. zoom in, or the pen tool, just knocking stuff out. Um, so I'm just going to keep moving on with some other images because this is all about getting all these images finished in time for stream, right? So we have this yes, shot. Yes, definitely. We can copy and paste the settings from this image over to the other one, just like that. And maybe it's not perfectly the same. So really quickly, I'm just going to match the white balance, bring the exposure down because it's a little bright. That's in a good spot. Take this into Photoshop. Love it. And just gonna... so you guys are aware, we have about... Uh, 20 minutes left. So please, if you have any questions for Daniel, please drop them in the chat. I'm sure he'd be happy to answer them. Um, yeah, I, I love this series. This is great. <laughs> so we're doing this at like actual full speed. Now that we have kind of the core principles down, I'm going to do my frequency separation layer. I'm going to build my cleanup layer. I'm actually going to close some of these documents just because my computer is getting a little hot. <laughs> Is the fan starting to go? Editing. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm going to do my cleanup layer on top of that. I'm going to do my uh, my color grading layers on top of that. And then I'll do my outfit uh, color layer as well. But that one actually has to go underneath the color grading layers. Awesome. Because like I said, the order of adjustment layers does matter. I love how the it looks so green. <laughs> awesome. I need one second. I might need to close light. I'm gonna save some space too. Oh, <laughs> you know, sometimes. <laughs> oh, Key says I have right. a challenge for Daniel somewhere up there, Arabella. Let's see what what challenge were you talking about? All right. Uh, he says, I have a challenge for Daniel to lower the difference distance between the carpet and the floor. Oh, like to extend it, you mean? Oh, to extend or... it out. Yeah, oh, I could do fun. that, especially we on could, the shot. We could try that. Yeah, why not? All right. So I have my, uh, I have all my layers set up for me in a matter of like 10 seconds from just clicking my action, a new layer, and then my two adjustment presets. Now I have all my layers built for the workflow of this document. And it's ready for me to start. So I would normally go in, do my frequency separation, you know, grab the blemishes, clean up the tone and texture. On my cleanup layer, I could quickly use the spot healing tool or the uh, erase tool or the remove tool. I'm going to grab the edge of my stand here. That's gone. Remove this. Nice. Get rid of that thing. I remember we're, we're trying to keep this consistent <laughs> between our shots. So. Like I said, once we get the first one done, we know everything that needs to be done in future shoots. So I knew immediately I had to do that, that. Um, if there were the weights in the scene, I would clean up the numbers because we already did that. And it's just bam, 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 just snapping to all those things. No, that's great. I love it. Then we want to do the outfit color. So I want to go to my background layer, use my, uh, my object selection tool. Now this one's kind of rough because the arm cuts off the outfit in a couple yeah. different places. So I'm going to try to use what is it? Or How you could change the, the mode at the top too. Like right there. Do you see the mode? Oh, the mode, yes. yeah. So then you can click down and it's the lasso. Now there you can go. literally just make a circle yes. around it and it'll Let be like, hi, do you want this? <laughs> outfit. <laughs> awesome. Perfect. Love it. <laughs> Even I'm learning new things on this stream. You know what? We all learn on these streams. I feel like I learned so much about frequency separation. So that was awesome. All right, and cool. sometimes that I won't do it really on the first one. try. So, you know, you got to like keep it moving. Let's go grab some more. I want to say pretty good, though, actually, for the pants. It did get a little bit of the. Oh, there you go. That's pretty good. And then just oh, that I forgot strap to hold down on the right. To grab it all. Oh. <laughs> Let's nice. try to get all that in one go then. That would be nice. <laughs> Okay, we're on to something. Yeah, and then yeah. The bottom pants. <laughs> and then I think just that right strap at the. Oh, yeah. On the. Or left. Her left strap. Very good. But even still, you can just even though it took us a couple passes, yeah. this is infinitely faster than manually Seriously. pen pulling this stuff out. <laughs> I mean, the edges are pretty clean and clear. Totally. I'm even doing a little manual. Uh, 
I'm going to do a manual lasso grab just to be quick about this. See, we, we still need to know the fundamentals because they you come know? in handy sometimes. <laughs> exactly. And I'm just going to grab oh, this. Joshua says, this stream is definitely replay worthy. <laughs> oh, thank you. It's really sweet. See, for this, it's like we're losing the edge of that in some of the detail. So if I, uh, I'm going to save this selection uh, really quick, just to so come back to it. I'm going to deselect that. I want to do my solar curve. And for things like this, it's also really helpful. Nice. Uh, if I turn that on. So I can see oh, yeah. exactly the edge of where this falls in this shadow. So I'm going to go back to my close selection, load that up again. Now I can perfectly see the edge of that. Where it's supposed to be. Love it. Great. Um, Got to remove. <laughs> Penny says, now we save so much time with all the updates. I completely agree. <laughs> and then we do our alpha color layer. And we've completely got wow. an amazing mask going of just the outfit. That's so good. <laughs> and we did it so quickly. Amazing. Then I turn my color grading layer on. The and orange and cyan matte. Love this it. is starting to match uh, the... Oh. There we go. Now this is starting to match the look of all our previous images. I love it. And then you, have, could, you could even like also make like an adjustment preset for that plant too, if you want. Yes, the plant. I forgot to grab that the plant, plant, man. I'm like, <laughs> we got to bring it back to life. Got to bring it oh, back. Oh, we're still on lasso. That's right. Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Sometimes the rectangle's better for things, certain things. <laughs> Once again, got a perfect grab of that plant. Like, oh, look at the, so good. the middle grabs in here and in here. It's amazing. I know. It's awesome. Yeah, just bringing those yellows back to life. Yeah, so how would you add the preset? Would you just like, oh, so you um, have that hue and saturation layer selected and then you would like hamburger mm -hmm. add it? So yes, if I go back to the modern view in our adjustments panel, uh, if I had this selected. Now, the one thing that I um, don't necessarily agree with Adobe on is when you create <laughs> the adjustment preset, whatever you title here, uh -huh. it will create a group with that title, but it won't name mm. the layers themselves. So if you have multiple layers in an adjustment preset, it won't tell you what each individual layer is doing. Like I like to do when I organize all my sure. layers. Yeah. So maybe that's uh, some feedback for the dev team. <laughs> but you, you can go. see here, it's still Drama. If, it's, <laughs> if it's one layer, it's perfectly fine because it just yeah. groups it into a titled layer or titled group. But if right. you have five layers inside of a, like a retouching uh, adjustment preset uh, and it's like a curves layer, a levels layer and a hue set layer, you don't necessarily know by looking at it what each of those are doing. Right. So like right. I said, this is great for global adjustments where it's like, you know, this is going to be on the entire image. Uh, mm -hmm. When it comes to more isolated masked things, I don't think it's as good. I think something like an action would be better because you can preserve sure. the titles of all those layers. Right. That makes sense. Hi, Daydream. Thanks for joining us. Uh, we are here with Daniel Livingstone. He is just doing some really fun edits over here on, in Photoshop, showing us all the new tools that have, uh, all the updated tools that we've gotten uh, in Adobe Photoshop. They're great. Um, I'm really enjoying the stream. So I hope you are too. <laughs> all right. So I'm going to put generative fill to the test. Ooh, I'm curious if it would even do it without a prompt too. I can test that as well. I try yeah. to be as specific as possible in my prompting just so I'm not um, scanning through and regenerating as like variations yeah. to get where I want to go. Sure. That makes sense. It's always like the fun waiting game <laughs> with this. Oh, okay. Oh. So. It's I like, a different here rug you go. There. New rug? Totally. <laughs> 
So I wonder if I actually do not say anything and just regenerate off of that. Possibly. Let's see. I love that it wanted to add a whole completely new rug. Uh, oh, yeah. Oh, my gosh. Hey, that looks really good. <laughs> yeah, wow. I did a really good job of sampling the existing pattern. Wait, too. can you zoom in a little bit? The detail. I'm curious. I'm so curious about this. Wow. Uh, that's really good. I'm like literally so impressed by Jen Phil. It's and it kind of matches insane. the depth of field fall off of the shot yeah. too, because it's a pretty shallow depth of field. So as it comes towards the camera, it really does get um, softer. I think this is where Jen Phil really excels because it's like the the less like sharp it has to be, it like really does that part really well, like that fuzzing out the kind of you know, blurry effect. <laughs> Another great Jen Phil thing is I was testing out before stream and I forgot mm -hmm. to show it in the first shot is um. In this shot, I actually added some art on the wall. Oh, that's a so good this one. Frank, because this felt really empty to me. So I, yeah. I was like, oh, this is kind of blank over here. There should be like some art on the wall. So I just did a prompt. I don't know, what did I prompt it? Place a framed <laughs> art piece on the wall. And it gave me these three at first, and they look a little wonky. So I just little, did a regeneration. Yeah. And I got this, which isn't oh bad. My gosh, hey. That one, which is pretty believable. And then this one I liked the most. Cause it kind of has like a transparency to it. So that it matches the, um, it looks like it's glass. So it matches the wall wow. behind it. I thought that really rooted it in reality. You could even then select like the black part of it and add in another image or some kind of art too. Yeah. Like if I could use another one of my images and just composite it. Yeah, in. Exactly. Oh, that would be I mean, so if we fun. Wanted to what a trip. <laughs> be hilarious about it. I could just merge my existing layer. I love it. And just put her. Oh my there. gosh. <laughs> Stop. I love that. <laughs> you know what? That's this is what Photoshop is for, for fun things like this. <laughs> it really is. You gotta have fun once in a while, even if you're retouching a lot. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and then we just And then just blur it out a little bit. Yeah. It'll be good. Uh Raphael, yes. Uh it was a blank prompt for the extending the carpet. There we go. Oh my gosh, look at that. Look how cute. And then I'm just going to match the. There you go. Beautiful. <laughs> this is like some inception style there we stuff. Go. Fun. <laughs> now you got to zoom in and add the photo to that. Another little one and then this one. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> Cody says yoga exception. <laughs> so I'm going to go back to Lightroom and I want to see if we can just get the other two images. Let's like, do it. Knocked Let's out. Do it. Um, obviously, these are not completed edits in their entirety. There's more retouching to do. I didn't really yes. do a full pass of the skin and the outfit and the mat. Um, and that's kind of where the time sink is when it comes to retouching. So uh, retouching still does take time. It's not a one click solution to everything. But the more that you practice it, the faster you will be at those parts too, like the totally. frequency separation, the tonal retouching, dodging and burning stuff, um, even like you can get faster at using the automated tools. Like you can get really good at grabbing uh, object selections precisely. Yeah, definitely. So I'm gonna grab something from our kitchen scene here. And this I is gonna be I love the kitchen nice... scenes, that, those are beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> I love this. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> You're gonna have to post that on your stories and then share the link. <laughs> Um, so with this kitchen scene, this is actually going to be a good example of another action that I've created. And this is where actions make more sense than adjustment presets. So I have an action that I created for I and teeth retouching. So I'm going to play that. It's going to build my group titled eyes and teeth. And I have three layers in it. It's a whiten layer, a teeth brightness layer, and an eye brightness layer. And with all of my actions that involve layers that need to be masked in locally, I have it set so it automatically inverts those masks. So they're not everywhere. Cause if it did, it would look like this. Right. <laughs> so when I build this action, it just kind of builds those layers and they're ready for me to just go straight into masking. So with the white layer, I'll just go to a white brush. I'll do 100% opacity, 100% flow. I'll zoom in and then I'll just paint in the mask where I want those teeth to be. Nice. And then to even speed up my workflow, because I used to like mask this, then go to teeth and just do the same masks. I can actually hold down the can I can hold down the uh, option or alt key. I can hold this mask and I can drag it on top of another layer and it copies that mask to that layer as well. 
So that's just another shortcut. If you're like masking, if you have multiple layers for the same thing you need masks, you can just mm -hmm. copy masks to other layers very quickly doing that. That's awesome. Instead of having to rebuild them. And then for the eye brightness, we can't see your eyes in that. So I can just delete that one. So there's our teeth whitening layer very from nice. this action that I built. And the layers themselves is a hue sat layer and it has uh, a desaturation on the reds. It has a desaturation and lightness adjustment on the yellows. And then the brightness layer is just modifying some level, the white point of some levels. I love that. That's very easy, very quick. And yeah, simplify the process for yourself because it'll save you time. And, th and then that way, like the things that do take up time, like skin retouching can be the only thing that's, you know, that's lengthy, so let's say but everything we, else is pretty set. Yeah. So let's say, obviously in a real world situation, we'd be doing frequency separation, retouching this image. So I'll at least build the layers out. <laughs> um, so we have that layer underneath. And then let's say I just want to do my outfit color change and my orange and cyan color grading. Obviously, we still need to mask that outfit color layer. Mm hmm so I need to invert that. Oh, and delete that group. Cause that was me experimenting whether I could do that, um, how, how the layers naming worked and oh, the right. localization. So that's how I found out that um, presets don't necessarily work for that super well. But we have our outfit color layer. I can uh, do my object selection on that. Cool. There we go. Object selection, grab the pants. <laughs> and I guess in that one too, you'll probably need to get the that color that's going through the glass as well. Um, I or mean, I think it... thing we could get away yeah. with. Okay. Just ignoring. Yeah. Reflections <laughs> yeah. are weird. <laughs> Nice. So let's say we want to turn them green just for the sake oh, of the pretty. example. Or anything, it's fine. Yeah. Since we started because we green. started with maroon, change it to blue. So now we're starting with blue, it moves over to green. Could even dial in like a more green green, yeah. That's pretty. And then we have our orange and cyan matting on top of that all. And it's still nice. subtle, it's still bright, it's still clean. We could do our retouching underneath it. If you want to see the true power of what actions can do, I actually have a, I'll do it on the next shot and that'll be our last shot of the stream. Perfect. Well, we've got three minutes. So speed flow right now. This is the real test. <laughs> the real test. <laughs> I'm going to close some of these documents to save on processing power. That that one's going in the story with the little uh. That has to go into the story. <laughs> then that, right. then you can share the link to the stream and have people watch it. <laughs> All right, so we got Photoshop up and we have our image. And I have a very developed action. I can show you like the inner workings of it. Uh, this is all wow. the steps involved. So it layer via copy, set current layer, layer via copy, set current layer. This is building that um, frequency separation. You can even have actions play off of other actions. Yeah, so I have like sense. certain tasks associated and then my workflow task is all those different steps so it's like build the eyes and teeth build the skin build the color grading build the retouching layer build the solar curve so that's what this is and this one actually implements photoshop's neural retouching feature into it so if nice. i play this action okay. i hope it's not out of date it's been a while since i've built it <laughs> But it should automatically run neural retouching on the subject. And then there we go. So it builds a clean layer. It builds a neural retouching layer, a layer for cleaning up hair. It has my eye and teeth layers ready for masking. And then it even has the old school dodge and burn. Nice. Okay. And everything's labeled. Everything's titled. It's telling me what I can do with those layers. And then a solar on top of it. And I that's love that. one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight layers all built out and titled and grouped in one click. Yeah, that's great because then you can just get right into it and get going. And it already does the retouching for me because it says using Photoshop's yeah. neural retouching. That's amazing. So I'm going to dial the opacity back a little bit on that just to preserve some more texture, but very loose cleanup. Then for the hair layer, this is basically my cleanup layer that we've been doing the entire time. Nice. 
So I'm going to use my uh, spy healing tool. Just grab these little flyaways. Perfect. <laughs> Keys says, now for the real questions. After workout, what do you prefer? Water, tea, juice, or coffee? <laughs> uh, 100% water. Yes. Uh, adding extra like sugars and stuff is, is a little counterintuitive. <laughs> if it helps you get Maybe it like done. water with lemon or something. That sounds good. Yeah. Fun. <laughs> I have been getting into iced tea lately, actually. I really like nice. iced tea now. <laughs> uh joshua says water all day long penny says orange juice then water and uh, michael says that is a cool action oh wow daniel this is such an amazing stream we are at time i'm so sad that we have to say goodbye but this is such a great um just like stream with all types of technique techniques and tips and and things so really really fun to see how you build everything um to make it easier for yourself to edit uh your photography so thank you guys so much for being here uh, make sure to stick around for all the other content that's happening today and the rest of the week so all right bye daniel thanks guys thank you bye